This video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you know me, you know that I'm normally pretty positive when it comes to the Warhammer 40K universe. There are very few things I don't like, whether it's overpowered characters, factions, or even instances of subpar writing. I always manage to find something really endearing about them. But at the end of the day, I'm human. I get overly opinionated sometimes, and every now and then there's something I come across that just sets me off and I need to vent. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. These are the five things that I've encountered in 40K recently that I absolutely cannot stand. The stuff that makes my skin crawl even thinking about it now. Whether it's individuals acting completely out of character, dumb ideas that an intern came up with and somehow nobody caught it before it made it all the way to promotional material, or even an entire faction that seems to only exist to ruin a book I was otherwise enjoying. Now, it took me years to compile this list, as I generally enjoy pretty much everything in 40k. But with that being said, let's dive into one of the most recent things that absolutely infuriated me. The Primarch Lorgar, but not for the reason you think. Okay, full disclosure, I took this one way too personally, and I kid you not, I was legitimately angry at a fictional character for like an entire week. Lorgar straight up ruined my weekend. I catch a lot of crap when I tell people Lorgar is my favorite Primarch, and that's definitely warranted. I'm the kind of guy who finds the villains a lot more fun than the protagonists. As any wrestling fan will tell you, everybody loves a good heel. Lorgar to me was this perfect mustache twirling villain who believed so strongly in their dark convictions that he was willing to sacrifice everything to see them come to fruition. That was all until I read the book Slaves to Darkness and after having finished it, I can safely assure you, Lorgar is no longer my favorite Primarch and I'm very upset that I spent so much time defending him. I genuinely feel like an idiot. So Lorgor's entire story arc here is he wants to overthrow Horus. He believes the War Master is not strong enough in his convictions to see the heresy all the way through to the end. And he thinks he's an arrogant fool for rejecting the Chaos Gods as his masters. He believes that even if Horus is successful in overthrowing the Emperor, he will not be able to lead the Imperium in the directions that the gods will. And again, Lorgar believes so strongly in the primordial truth and that the Chaos Gods are the true nature of the universe and their will must be made manifest no matter what. He believes this so strongly, he's willing to sacrifice everything. So after a long string of events, including the demonic binding of his brother Fulgrim and shackling him to his service, he finally gets his chance to kill Horus near the end of the book. Now, Lorgar doesn't realize that Horus has been tipped off about his betrayal. And before he can unleash his psychic attack, the War Master pummels him into the dirt. But Horus, whether being fair and merciful or an antagonizing dick, depending on your perspective, picks up Lorgar's mace and drops it on his chest. He tells him to pick it up and fight him. That this is the moment. This is what he wanted. Take the mantle of War Master from me. The Emperor didn't give you this chance when he burned Monarchia, nor did Gilliman when he stood by and watched. I am giving you that chance to fight for what you want. Pick up the mace. Lorgar, having rolled over onto his knees, is kneeling in front of Horus with his head down and refuses to pick it up and fight. Horus shouts at him to pick it up, but he refuses. The War Master, disgusted by his cowardice, tells him to get out of his sight and never show his face again. Lorgar tells him that he is sickened by what he has become, a gaping maw of darkness. And Lorgar leaves, never to be seen again during the heresy. So let me get this straight. The religious extremist psychopath that is willing to do anything for the nonsense he believes in, who has willingly allowed himself to be a puppet of the gods and views the War Master as someone who will cause their plans to ultimately fail, suddenly refuses to fight for his beliefs. To say this is completely out of character for every single way he has been portrayed up until this point is a massive understatement. And it's made a thousand times worse as it is the conclusion to his story arc as far as we know in the Horus Heresy. Flaws to me are what make a character interesting. I don't like Lorgar because I think he's admirable, far from it. He's a complete piece of shit. I like him because he's a great antagonist. He makes you hate him and you wanna see him get what's coming to him. Lorgar is all about faith and conviction doing what must be done for his own stupid ideals. For him to just wuss out is so out of character, it makes my head spin. I would have been fine with Horus killing him, or the gods sending him a sign that this is what they want, or Lorgar being in awe of how powerful Horus has become and fully devoting himself to his cause, literally anything else. So goodbye, Lorgar. You're not my favorite Primarch anymore. And I don't know who is my new favorite. It's a toss up between the angry man-child, edgelord Batman, and man feathers. Let me know down in the comments which one is the best and why and help me decide. Before we move on to the next one, here's a quick word from this week's sponsor. I know at this point you've heard of Squarespace before, and that's because Squarespace is one of the most trusted names in website design. They can help you build a website for pretty much anything. 
Need a gallery to show off all of your creative works? A blog to talk about all of your recent experiences? Or is 2022 finally gonna be the year that you launch that small business you've been thinking of starting? Whatever it is that you're trying to do, Squarespace has hundreds of easy to use templates that can bring that website you've been dreaming of to life. But if you're not confident in your creative skills and you feel like having a trained professional along for the ride may end up giving you a better package overall, Squarespace has you covered as they actually have a built-in feature that matches you with a trained professional who has years of creative experience when it comes to website design. The combination of Squarespace's amazing templates, along with the trained eyes of a professional, can help you create the website of your dreams. And if this sounds like something that you'd be interested in, then you can use the link in my description, squarespace.com slash Weshammer, and use the code Weshammer to get 10% off your first website or domain. And additionally, Squarespace offers a seven day free trial. So you can try it out and get a feel for it before you launch that website. Thanks again to the amazing people over at Squarespace for sponsoring this video and let's get into the grimdark. Literally everything about 30K Space Wolves. I want to like the Space Wolves so freaking bad. They have so many cool things going on. First, they're space marine vikings that ride giant wolves into battle, and that's badass. Second, they have a unit of werewolves that act like shock troops. And third, since space marines enhanced organs filter out toxins almost immediately, they literally can't get drunk. So the space wolves invented their own type of alcohol that would get them drunk because it's basically just poison. A single sip could kill 10 normal men. And being that dedicated to partying, I can totally relate to that. But every single time they show up in the novels, I cannot stand them. I'm gonna be completely honest with you, this comes from a complete place of ignorance, as I've never read an entire novel specifically about them. I've read a lot of short stories where they're the main characters and they have a tendency to pop up in the books all the time, but I've yet to read the Space Wolf Omnibus or Prospero Burns or anything like that. So maybe with a few more books under my belt, my viewpoint will change, but as it stands right now, I cannot stand these guys. Every single time a Space Wolf shows up in the books, they follow the exact same archetype. An edgy barbarian man who only plays by his own rules. They're basically like, haha, Ultramarines, I will not follow your rules. I set my own path. I'm something of a lone wolf. And the Ultramarines are like, no dude, seriously, like we're, we're kind of formulating a plan and we kind of need you to stick to it in order to be successful. And the Space Wolf is like, all right, fine. I'll stick to your plan this one time, I guess. And then inevitably, every single time, the Space Wolf will just fuck right off and doesn't stick to the plan and does his own thing. Which would be fine if that ended up having consequences, but it very rarely does. The story structures itself around the Space Wolf to make everything work out for them. Or at the very least, have them sacrifice themselves at the end of the book. And all of the Ultramarines and stuff are sitting around like, wow, what a badass. I swear to God, every time this happens, my eyes roll so hard they go back in time and I have to reread that nonsense for a second time. I've actually gotten stuck in a perpetual loop like this a couple of times and it's not fun. Not to mention their hypocrisy when it comes to psychic powers, absolutely hating the Thousand Suns for it, yet doing it themselves with the Rune Priest and claiming it's totally different. Or pretty much everything revolving around Prospero. They literally massacred a loyalist legion and millions of loyalist civilians on a loyalist world and there was zero repercussions for it. Magnus messed up and paid for it severely. Russ messed up and nothing. Not even the emperor leashing his dogs and being like, okay, yeah, I'm reining you guys back in because this is definitely not what I ordered you to do. And you just turned a powerful ally into a powerful enemy. And later on, when it was revealed to Lehman Russ that he had been tricked by Horus, that his orders weren't to kill them, it was just to go and bring Magnus in for trial, he was absolutely furious. But not because of, you know, all the people he murdered. No, Lehman Russ was mad because somebody managed to trick him. That's what he was upset about. No regrets, no remorse, just mad that someone tricked him. Every legion has its strengths and weaknesses, but they're always portrayed as such. The wolves defining feature in the heresy seems to be idiocy and hypocrisy. And the books treat this like it's an honorable quality. To say the least, it's unbelievably frustrating to read. Now from everything I've read, 40K Space Wolves are completely different to their counterparts over in 30K. So I think I would like the 40K Space Wolves a lot more. Because here's the thing about me, when I hate something or even just strongly dislike it, I have to research it into oblivion to make sure that my hate is justified. So I'm gonna read Ragnar's story, the Space Wolf Omnibus, and maybe a couple other Space Wolf books, and I'll do a follow-up on this. So look for a video in the future that's either called I Still Hate the Space Wolves or I Was Completely Wrong About the Space Wolves. The Tyranids were created by the Necrons. Now this one's a bit of a weird one, as it has a high probability of not actually being canon. 
but the story comes from official GW source material and definitely sent me into a rage fest, so we're gonna talk about it. Now, when the Necrons got a massive release in 9th edition, this included a model for the Silent King. The Silent King returning to the franchise is a pretty big deal, as the man himself has not been seen in this galaxy for 60 million years. He held himself responsible for what happened to his people, as it was him who was tricked by the Deceiver into forcing them to undergo biotransference, which made the Necron Tear become the metal robot skeletons that we know today. After all of his people went to sleep in their tomb world, he entered a self-exile, hopped in his ship, and left our galaxy. It's this big old mystery on what he was doing out there in the void of space for 60 million years. Now, released as a bit of promotional material in White Dwarf issue 450, there was a Harlequin Shadow Seer of the Dreaming Shadow Troop, who went on to explain that out there in the cold regions of space, he created creatures of infinite hunger that he would release upon the universe. Now, for a long time, people have been theorizing that the Tyranids were actually created by the Old Ones, as their primary role was to seed life throughout the galaxy. So it would make sense that they would engineer some kind of reset button, and that's what the Tyranids would do. They would sweep across the galaxy, consuming all life, until there was nothing left, and since they had nothing left to eat, they would die out. Now, that storyline for them was never canon, but it was a very popular fan theory. So the Silent King could kind of fill a similar role here. If it was actually him who created the Tyranids, then he could use them to wipe out the galaxy and leave it for the Necrons to inherit. And this would actually make a lot of sense, based on how the Tyranids interact with the Necrons. First and foremost, they have no ability to absorb the Necrodermis bodies that the Necrons are made from, so they can't convert them into biomass, which is pretty much the primary objective for Tyranids. Second, when Tyranids devour a world, they pretty much just stick to the surface, and they don't dig too far down. They render every living thing into biomass and take a portion of the world's mineral wealth. But this is mostly limited to being above the crust, meaning that the Necron tombs that are buried far deeper than this would be relatively safe. And finally, because they can't absorb them, the Tyranids view any engagements with the Necrons as a losing battle, as whatever the Necrons destroy is just lost biomass. They don't gain anything out of a fight with them, so they tend to just move on, only fighting to defend themselves and ceasing as soon as the Necrons stop attacking. So like, yeah, on the surface level, this all makes a lot of sense. The Tyranids are likely the perfect ally for the Necrons, if their goal was to simply eradicate all life in the galaxy. But this contradicts with recent lore that points out that one of the primary objectives of the Necrons is to find a host species they can download their subconscious into and reverse the process of biotransference, effectively allowing them to pick up where they left off 60 million years ago. And if this is a retcon of a retcon, I'm not actually opposed to those. I actually tend to enjoy retcons, sometimes under specific circumstances. When it's done by adding new information or characters to pre-existing lore to recontextualize what you thought you knew, love it, can't get enough of it. But this, this is just stupid, as it ruins what makes the Tyranids special. Having the Tyranids just be a weapon of the Necrons, I feel it completely lessens what they are as a faction. It robs them of agency and changes the hive mind from this godlike entity beyond the bounds of our galaxy and human understanding to just an invention of the Silent King? And the Necrons actually had a massive pivot with their lore back in 5th edition, where they went from this spooky, unknowable galactic evil to an actual, pardon the pun, fleshed out species, complete with likable and endearing characters and a whole lot of nuance that you can actually write novels about. Now, regardless of how you feel about spooky Crons versus new Crons, it's an undeniable fact that their lore was vastly expanded on in a way that opened up tons of avenues for storytelling. They got less spooky, but had an enormous amount of depth added to them. If the Tyranids were created by the Silent King, it adds no depth to the Tyranids, only some to a single character, that of the Silent King himself. So in terms of storytelling potential, it's just a net loss for the bugs. A lot of people have tried to dismiss this as not true, and even I'm desperately grasping at the Eldar be lying all the time excuse to prove there's no merit to this. But I'm not 100% convinced, and only time will tell if Games Workshop decides to pursue this storyline. Horus's Fall to Corruption now, this one's a bit more of a massive disappointment for me rather than just pure unadulterated hate. I didn't get into the Horus Heresy until about four years ago. Before then, I had only read 40k books. It was always this super daunting and massive series that had over 60 books in it, and it just seemed like a mountainous task to get into. But here's the thing, I really wanted to. It was this series I just kind of sat on forever, knowing at any moment I could dive into this absolutely massive series. And if I got into it, I would have a ton of content ready to consume and keep myself entertained for years. It's kind of how I feel about One Piece. Never watched it before, but one day I will. And if I like it, then that's just gonna be my life for a while. I figured with 60 books, it would cover an enormous amount of material. Hell, I didn't think Horus would turn traitor until around book 20 or 30. I knew the Great Crusade was a massive period of time. 
that would have to be covered first and that all of the Primarchs falling to chaos would have an enormous amount of intricacy with each and every one of them. Whether it be political reasons, personal vendettas, or even just good old fashioned demonic corruption. I thought the storyline would take a huge amount of time building up to this. Little conflicts here and there that would build on each other. Tiny cracks in the mighty dam that would spread until a breaking point was reached. Slowly over time, little by little, each of those splinters growing deeper and wider, a spider web of lies, deception, and subtle revelations that would cause the War Master to become disillusioned with his father's Imperium and turn against him, all while the forces of chaos slowly wormed their way in, exacerbating those cracks by slowly manipulating all of the pieces on the board. But nope, he totally switches sides in book two, because a dude with face tattoos told him to. And it wasn't even this big conflicting thing where you could kind of understand where he was coming from. It was literally just him going into a fugue state and Erebus going, hmm, chaos? And Horus being like, yeah, all right, fair enough. I was sitting there like, that, that's it? That's what happened? My disappointment is immeasurable. And my day is ruined. Now that being said, I do actually really love the Horus Heresy. Other than that initial disappointment, I've never really hated any of the books, except for maybe Battle for the Abyss. And honestly, it's not as bad as everyone says, it's just kind of a filler episode. I honestly consider the books in the Horus Heresy to be some of the best writing in all of Warhammer. I just wish the opening trilogy had had like, I don't know, 20 books come out first. Maybe once the Siege of Terra wraps up, we'll start getting great crusade novels, but only time will tell. The Demonic Possession of Fulgrim. Now this is another one that was a massive disappointment for me. The novel Fulgrim is absolutely amazing and one of my favorite books in the Horus Heresy. It shows his slow descent into madness after being corrupted by a demonic sword and slowly turning towards Slanesh. At one point, the demon in the sword manages to possess Fulgrim and completely take over his body. At the very end of the book, Fulgrim is speaking to Horus after the drop site massacre and Horus is eventually like, yeah, you can cut the act. I know you're not my brother. The demon is kind of shocked and he's like, oh, what, what do you mean? Of course I'm Fulgrim. And Horus is like, yeah, knock it off. I honestly don't really care either way. Can you fight and will you follow me? That's all that really matters. And the demon swears loyalty to him, but it's revealed that Fulgrim's soul is still trapped inside his own body, being forced to watch what the demon did or more accurately made him do, including the murder of his brother Ferris Manus, the person that he was closer to than anyone else in the universe. This is pretty dark stuff and it made for an amazing twist at the end of the book. And it set up a really interesting storyline. I immediately went to Google trying to figure out if that meant that the demon snake man Fulgrim wasn't actually Fulgrim at all, and if his uncorrupted soul is still trapped in there somewhere. I had so many questions and I was so excited, only for it to be revealed a few books later that that plotline got completely scrapped. He offhandedly mentions to someone that, oh yeah, that demon, no, don't even worry about it. I exercised it off screen, but I really liked how powerful it made me and I'm actually super into all this corruption stuff, so I'm gonna act exactly the same for no explicit reason. It was such a massive waste of a cool storyline. But whatever, Fulgrim the way he is is fine. I like Fulgrim. I just was super disappointed. And those are all the things in 40K that made me rage. Now mind you, it took me a couple years to build those up, as for the most part, I enjoyed just about everything in this franchise. But I'm sure I'm gonna be able to build up another list like this if you guys like this type of content. But what do you guys think? Do you agree with me on some of these things or do you think I'm just overreacting? Also, what's something in 40K that's rubbed you the wrong way? Is there a person in the story that acted completely out of character and just sucked you out of the experience? Or is there a particular faction that seems to be really popular but you just can't get into? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments section. Big thank you to all my patrons that support me over on Patreon. And because of you guys, I was able to invest in a whole podcast set up and me and my friends just released our very first episode using the new microphones. So if awkward nerds getting drunk and rambling about 40k is something that you're interested in, maybe check out our Patreon. Thanks again and I'll catch y'all in the next one.